So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Carwan. My name is Ishan Sharma, and uh, I'm here to host a wonderful speaker on Carwan today, Dr. Salif Simons, and I'll give an introduction in a in a few moments. But before that, welcome to Carwan. Carwan is one of India's leading students-led initiative, and we have been doing uh, organizing lectures and conversations for the last two years. Thank you so much for all your support and love that you have given to Carwan. Uh, today's theme, Renewing the Medieval Authority, Power and Dynastic Continuity in Colonial Mysore Genealogies, talk about the genealogical genre in India, uh, which is a vital resource for the understanding of Indian kingship. The colonial encounter shifted how genealogies were imagined and were retold. Uh, in Kanorian Mysore, for instance, the subject of this lecture today, we have both the Indian and British understanding of sovereignty mutually constituted uh, meaning within political imaginations of that time. As products of the negotiation between the two uh, regimes, Indian and British, genealogies from the court of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raj, Krishna Raj III work within and through modes of historiography from India and Europe. And in this lecture, Dr. Selef Simons will discuss how these genealogies remain rooted in the local uh, concerns of sovereignty in which devotion and divine authority uh, were central, were the main pieces of, of, of uh, discussion maybe, and, and how these themes were shaped through a positivist lens that reframed these lineages. Blending Indian and European modes of historiography, the genealogies of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III are unique in their composition, which are produced in relation with and response to, uh, and also reaction to uh, European modes of political theology, governance, and meaning making. So introducing today's speaker, Dr. Selef Simons is currently associate professor at the University of Arizona. He did his PhD in religion from University of Florida. He specializes in religion in South Asia and especially Hinduism. His research specialities span religion and state formation in medieval and colonial India to contemporary transnational aspects of Hinduism and much more. And his book, uh, which came out recently, I think 2019, talked about the same theme. So without further ado, welcome, uh, Dr. Simons. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It is truly an honor hosting you uh, this evening, this morning for you. <laughs> Thank you, Ashan. This is a great honor for me. I um, always love uh, talking to, to people in India and throughout the world, but particularly in India about these uh, about these issues because uh, we have different perspectives from our you know different histories, and so it it actually you know as I bring out in, in this material, it's you know how we frame ourselves tells us so much about our, our histories and even more so for Karwan being a student-led initiative uh, makes this even more meaningful for me because uh, you know while we we do this for the, the greater learning uh, interactions with students is uh, one of the most important things that we can that we can do um, so I, I thank you for having me and thank you for everyone who's tuning in I'm, I'm very excited about this uh, so I'll give just a little bit of preamble before I jump into my prepared remarks uh, but this this research project grew out of my my research throughout my dissertation, uh, and then we eventually, uh, I think, two chapters of my dissertation I expanded for my first book, Devotional Sovereignty, which you can actually see above me right there. Uh, <laughs> and I, in this, I, I try to think about how politics change in relationship to different perspectives. And I've carried forth and actually just got copies of my, my next book, Singing the Goddess, was just published, uh, which kind of takes this as a starting point and then jumps into how caste is affected by how people tell histories. So with no further ado, let me just go ahead and share my screen and we'll we'll jump into this. All right, there's the, the lovely poster that was made for this event. Um, let me get my remarks up. All right, so the title of my talk today is Renewing the Medieval Authority, Power, and Dynastic Continuity in, in Colonial Mysore Genealogies. And as I said oh, previously, 
Uh, this comes from my, my book that was published in 2019 or 2020. It was right at the cusp. So some books have 19 on it, some will have 20. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, it's it says kingship and religion in India, but really the focus of it is colonial Mysore. The genealogical genre in India is a vital resource for understanding Indian kingship. The colonial encounter shifted how genealogies were imagined and retold. In colonial Mysore, the subject of this lecture, both Indian and British understandings of sovereignty mutually constituted meanings within political imaginations. As products of negotiations between two regimes, uh, that of Europe and that of India, genealogies from the courts of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja Warrior III work within and through two different modes of historiography from India and Europe. In this lecture, I'm gonna discuss how these genealogies of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III remain rooted in local concerns of sovereignty in which devotion and divine authority were central and how these themes were shaped through a positive lens, positivist lens that reframed their lineage in conversation with European modes. So by blending Indian and European modes of historiography, the genealogies of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja Warrior III are unique in their composition produced in relation with, response to, and reaction against European modes of political theology, governance, and meaning making. In India, as many of you know, genealogy has always been an important site of contestation, and its narratives were reworked, recreated, and recontextualized in order to situate kings and their kingdoms within a world of political meaning throughout the medieval period. In this way, from Shavali texts, function like Puranic material, particularly discussed as discussed by Travis L. Smith, one of my dissertation advisors and a fantastic scholar of, of the Puranas. Smith suggests that Puranic texts were malleable. They had an ability to be reworked, recreated, amended and appended. And it gives us insights into historical events when the development of their episodes um, in different periods are examined. Smith argues that the power of the narratives is in their authors and their editors' ability to couch contemporaneous debates within the events of a divine past, in this way giving the resulting narrative both divine and temporal authenticity. And here's a, here's a quote from me. It says, quote, the legendary events of the past are updated for the present, and at the same time these past narratives are presented as future predictions of events with the predictions being made in divine prehistory. So just as the Puranas described by Smith Renu the Ancient, that's the title of his, his article this comes from, the genealogical texts from the courts of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III build upon older medieval texts by inserting new tales and stacking devotional elements and interactions with the divine upon one another in order to produce new narrative thrusts in the new understanding of royal power and dynastic continuity. The Vamshavali texts uh, in ground Mysore rulers by reimagining recent medieval political history within a realm of divine human interaction, thereby renewing the medieval claims of sovereignty within their own rule. This renewal of the medieval was inherently a negotiation of the colonial political situation. As rulers in this period of political transition, the courts of both Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raj III used genealogy as sites through which they could construct a history of kingship in the region. They could set precedents of succession and patterns for rule and fashion their contemporaneous kings in light of all of these concerns. The genealogies, therefore, are perhaps the most important genre for us to understand the development of sovereignty and the role of the king in colonial Mysore as they reflect myth, legend, history, lineage, and political structures through the kaleidoscope of the colonial encounter. So there we have Krishna Raja the third. All right, so let's turn to Tipu Sultan. Actually, no, uh, that's one too fast. All right, so the next section of this lecture is called Authority, Power, and Dynastic Continuity. Uh, so as political histories and mytho, uh, mytho-religious texts, if we want to call it that, the genealogies of the courts of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raj III can tell us a great deal about the construction of power and authority within colonial South Indian kingship. These texts provide us with insight into the construction of sovereignty and explain the continuity of power from one ruler to the next that is grounded in divine authority. 
Particularly, these texts display different means through which kingship is sanctioned, vis a vis divine injunction, as they fashion both Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III as kings of indirect biological succession. Without claims to direct bloodlines, Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III and their courts fashion the perennial power of kingship and dynastic continuity through different forms of divine election and devotion. During their reigns, the courts of both Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III had to negotiate between two forms of biopolitics, reconciling the differences in the constitution of royal power and authority. As kings without direct with indirect claims to the throne, royal authorization was ultimately relocated within the locus of the divine through an alternate means of election. For Tipu Sultan, proof of divine election was based on his innate royal abilities, the abilities that were both a product of his ancestry and also his correct forms of devotion. His royal power was constituted by the same authority and arose from the same sources as the spiritual power of the great Sufi peers. Krishna Raja III and his court, on the other hand, constructed a lineage history that demonstrated his divine ancestry and displayed his divine election through means of interaction between the warrior kings and their deities. So now let us turn to the genealogies of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III to show how they and their courts used the genealogical genre to ground their king's rule within medieval political history and display dynastic continuity through non-biological succession. Now let's turn to Tipu Sultan. Uh, Tipu Sultan, for people who don't know, ruled in Mysore from 1782 to 1799, the period often known as the Mysore Sultanate. Uh, through these, this period, uh, it's you know sort of ingrained into a lot of uh, histories because of the Anglo-Mysore Wars, uh, which helped solidify uh, the power of the British in the in the, the south. Now here's a picture of Tipu Sultan. Um, because he's right here with his famous Babri motif um, clothing. Uh, this is Mysore Kingdom at the time. You can see this grayed out region uh, through here. This is about the, the height of his kingdom, how large it was. So it was you know, uh, a pretty good chunk of South India uh, at its height. All right, then let's turn to his genealogies. So we're on focus here on uh, the Nishani Hyder uh, and talk about the devotional alliance uh, that was formed. Uh, and again, if you want to go, we're going to do this very briefly. If you want more in-depth information, of course, you can always ask, um, uh, or you can um, read the book. So perhaps the best-known genealogy of Tipu Sultan and his lineage is the Nishani Haidri, a uh, Persian history written by Mir Hussein Ali Khan Kermani, but sometime between 1798 and 1802. Kermani was a member of the Mysore court and seems to have been well-versed in the genealogical tropes of, the, of medieval and early modern South India. Many of the elements of the courtly paradigms of this genealogy, of genealogy are present in the opening section of the book and warrant our attention. In this, in this text specifically, we can see the centrality of devotion within the construction of royal power in the court of Tipu Sultan. Kermani's text begins with an invocation of Allah as sovereign and king of all kings. The language is clearly used to elicit connections between the earthly ruler and the deity that's being praised. In this way, it's very similar to Sanskrit Slesha or Kanada Padiru. And the author goes, starts framing the primary role of the king through martial prowess and the rhetoric of protection, something that we won't really get into today, but is another key aspect in a lot of the genealogies of Tipu Sultan and his family. So the sovereign here, and again, is, is talking about Allah, but it's uh, a, sort of a uh, pun or a, um, a slesha uh, where it's referring to both Allah and uh, the, the king Tipu Sultan. So the sovereign is described as a powerful conqueror, one who conquers in order to protect his devotees. The text then transitions to the lineage of Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, beginning with Hyder Ali's great grandfather, Sheikh Wali Muhammad. So we have, I sort of, rebuilt the, um, the family tree here. So according to the text, uh, Wali Muhammad uh, migrated from Delhi to the Gulbarga, where he was attendant to the Darga of the Sufi saint uh, Muhammad al-Husseini, also known as Gisu Daraz, during the reign of Muhammad Abdul Shah of Bijapur. 
After serving faithfully for years, Tipu Sultan's uh, great father, Sheikh Muhammad Ali, uh, which I'm just realizing I left out of my um, uh, my chart here, uh, was married to the daughter of one of the Pirzadas. Uh, after several more years, the family migrated to Bijapur to live with the seven brothers of Muhammad Ali's wife and to work in the court of one of Bijapur's Amirs. After all seven brothers were killed in battle, Muhammad Ali and his wife and children moved to Kolar uh, to work in the service of one of the ministers of the king of Sira, which was a, a Mughal province. There, Ali had four sons, including his youngest, Fat Ali, Tipu Sultan's grandfather. Fat Ali left home to take a position in Arkat, but after the death of the Nawab of Arkat, Dost Ali Khan, Fat Ali was called into service by the Mysore king, who conferred upon him the title of Nayaka. So this is where his family is elevated to sort of ruler status. Uh, while in the service of Mysore, Fat Ali uh, had a son named Shabazz, and after a quarrel with the Mysore king, Fat Ali resumed his father's old station in Sira in Kolar. Hyder Ali was born during Fat Ali's time in Kolar. After his birth, astrologers from the court prophesied that Hyder Ali would someday become a king and rule over both northern and southern Karnataka. The prophecy, however, said that if Fat Ali that it also said that Fat Ali would die soon and that Hyder Ali would be raised an orphan. Soon after these events, sure enough, it happened. Uh, and with treachery afoot, Fat Ali was killed in battle, and the son of the Nawab seized all of Fat Ali's property and imprisoned his widow and his son, Shabazz, in Hyder Ali. After intervention from the Mysore king and several other battles, the family was released when large ransoms were paid by their uncle. Having grown up through these ordeals, both Shabazz and Hyder Ali left Syria and joined the armies of Mysore. Shabazz in time returned to Sira, but uh, Hyder Ali won the favor of the Mysore Dalavai Prime Minister Nanjaraja and quickly ascended the ranks, becoming Dalavai himself. Uh, though some of these details uh, differ between other texts like the Hyder Nama, which was another one of Tipu Sultan's genealogical texts that I discussed in the book, and we can talk a little bit more about in Q&A if people want, because it closely resembles Vijayanagaravam Shavali's. Uh, we won't get into it today, but it, it differs a little bit in some of the details. So it makes building a, a, a sort of positive, positivist histor history of people saw time different, difficult. The overall narrative follows similar patterns, with the exception to the reference of the Darga of the Sufi Saint Yusuf Duraz. This is a, a novel element. Uh, the marriage alliance between the family of Tipu Sultan and the descendants of the saint who presided over the shrine. This portion of the narrative provides an important link to the devotional relationship of the family of Tipu Sultan and the devotion to local powerful Sufi saints that is emphasized in Kirmani's text. Susan Bailey, in her study of Tamil devotional traditions, has shown that the courts of aspiring Muslim kings often use narratives of marriage alliances with the families of Sufi peers in order to stake their claims to regional thrones. She demonstrates that local rulers became political and religious leaders of their realm, channeling the power of the peer and assuming uh, the position of authority through this alliance in what she calls an extended genealogy. She states that by focusing on the idea, uh, as a quote, quote, by focusing on the idea of Sufis as precursors of kings, it became possible for newly established ruling lines to claim ties of descendant and, or spiritual kingship kinship to the great saints of the past, through, through them and to the prophets himself. Such extended genealogies were particularly important to aspiring rulers with less than illustrious family backgrounds, end quote, says a long quote. Likewise, uh, the Nishani Haidri, uh, in which Tipu's grandfather Muhammad Ali marries into the Sufi saint Gusud Daraz, provides an important link to imperial devotion. Gusud Daraz himself had been an important Chishti saint who moved to Gulbarga at the invitation of a Bahmani king. There we have Gisu. Now he is credited with taking the of taking uh, Shishti uh, Sufism to the south, where it was integrated into the courts of the Deccan. Richard Eaton, who previously uh, gave a Karwan special lecture, has said of the saint, quote, most importantly, Gisu Daraz contributed to the stabilization and indigenization of Indo-Muslim society and polity in the Deccan, as earlier generations of Sufi sheikhs had already done in North India, end quote. The connection with the family of this imperial saint through a marriage alliance within the text provides another source of divine authority for Tipu Sultan. 
It extends his domain to include spiritual territory, and it further elevates his claim to an illustrious family lineage, one that he was lacking uh, potentially previously. So this relationship between Tipu Sultan and the state uh, saint is not merely something concocted to serve a rhetorical purpose. Tipu Sultan was a great devotee of Yusuf Daraz and frequently visited his dargah. Tipu Sultan also regularly recorded his dreams in which the saint would visit the king. These dreams seem to have fulfilled the same function as the genealogical narrative by affirming the divinely sanctioned authority of Tipu Sultan and his claims to the throne. Tipu Sultan even tried to reaffirm this alliance by requesting one of the daughters of the Pirzadas, uh, Gisu Daraz's Darga, for marriage in the mid-1790s. However, the descendants of the Pir ultimately did not maintain the same belief concerning Tipu Sultan's lineage and denied the marriage request. Despite the setback, the, peer, the connection to the Pir and the Darga was maintained in the Nishani Haidari, uh, in the, and in the king's dream journals, constructing a renewed history of the king's biological lineage that was constituted in both political and spiritual realms of power. So as we've seen in this very abbreviated example, Tipu Sultan and his court were aware of, aware of and actively engaged with the royal genealogical traditions of South India. The genealogies of Tipu Sultan and his lineage incorporate many of the major motifs and paradigms that were common in the genealogical materials of the region, including narrative and visual forms, which we didn't really go into. Through this engagement, the lineage text of the Mysore Sultanate fashioned Tipu Sultan as the king with proper ancestry, connecting him to the Prophet Muhammad and important Deccani Muslim dynasties, and divine authorization of his royal power. Simultaneously, these texts make a connection or make a case for non-biological succession in which merit and devotion are proof of a royal of a ruler's divine election. By blending elements of the medieval practice of genealogy making and king fashioning with notions of dynastic continuity through dynastic service and devotion, Tipu Sultan and his court effectively make a case for Tipu Sultan as the proper successful successor and rightful heir to both the Mysore and Kaledi thrones. So now let's turn our attention to uh, Krishna Raja Woodyam. So same context, but a slightly um, smaller kingdom. Now we're talking about uh, the red portion. Uh, so Krishna Raja the third, or in Kannada, Mumadi, which means the third. Uh, here he is in a devotional text. It's at the San Diego Museum of Art. That's him right there. We'll pull him out so you can you can get a good look. Uh, so here's just a few things about him. He was stalled as a child uh, after the fall of Tipu Sultan. Uh, upon his maturity, he got the full rule of the kingdom. But in 1831, uh, the British stepped in and started to administer the kingdom. And so 1831 began his period of indirect rule, which will be the period that we're discussing today. So even more than Tipu Sultan, the genealogies of Krishna Raja III specifically emphasized uh, the Woodiers, that's his lineage, their divine lineage, and placed their rulers, the Woodier ru rulers, within the world of the gods and goddesses through mythic context. Through the Vimshavali genre, the genealogical genre, the courts of, T of Krishna Raja III constructed dynastic continuity in the region that begins with Mahavishnu at creation and can be traced to the, through the legendary founders of the Woody or Mysore kingdom. Operating unbound by the confines of biological succession, their texts construct royal power that runs parallel to human concerns, but that ultimately, ultimately rests in the world of supernatural metaphysics and divine interactions. Central in this formation of royal authority and power is the king's role as devotee par excellence. Traditional medieval pilgrimage centers are situated as sites of power and authority with their deities manifesting to appoint and guide the woodier kings. Furthermore, the devotionalism of Krishnaraja III and his predecessors is opened up and is expressed through an expanded big tent Hindu devotionalism that includes the goddess, Vaishnava, and Shaiva practices. These genealogical texts also reflect a cognizance of the changing political tides in which the British dominated administrative and military life in India in two important ways that will be discussed in brief below and in great detail in my book. First, the Vamshavalis from his reign demonstrate a newfound approach to historiography in which they employ both 
um, they employ certain positivist uh, principles. As a site of contested politi political history, they also become a site in which religious and communal identity can be articulated. Second, the texts archive a view of kingship that is coming to terms with colonial vassalage, in which the king's authority and his display of power had to be reconstituted to reflect the domain over which he had sovereignty. Thus, the world of kingship and the genealogical text of Krishnaraja III reflect his rule over a domain of devotion, a domain authorized by the deities and over which he and his family alone were sovereign. And this way, his Vamshavalis, built upon the genealogical genre from the medieval period and from the reign of Tipu Sultan, are updated to reflect the new political situation of, the Brit of Mysore as a British subordinate. So the text that we'll be talking about here uh, is the Mysuru Sumsnarada uh, Prabhugalu Sri Man Maharaj Avaram Shavali. Uh, so that's a, a mouthful. I'll just refer to it as the as the SMV uh, throughout this, um, or sometimes I'll refer to it as the Annals of the My Mysore Royal Family, which you see here in the print edition is what it was called. Uh, the text was was written in the 1860s. Uh, an exact date is is difficult to nail down. Uh, and the text itself is said to have been composed by the King, King Krishnaraja III himself. Um, so the text, as I said, was originally composed by Krishnaraja III in the later years of his rule and shows the development of political thought over the course of his reign. The SMV relates the lineage of the Mysore kings from creation of the cosmos down to the birth of its contemporaneous king, that is Krishnaraja III himself. The text focuses on an overtly Hindu form of kingship, even using uh, in Kannada the Hindu shaili or Hindu style uh, several times throughout the text. However, the text is not as concerned with the construction of religious identity as has been the case in uh, the genealogies from early in his rule or in previous um, what are your kings? They used to really focus on um, their Vaishnava identity, their Shakta identity. Like uh, this is something I looked at my dissertation is how they constructed their own uh, devotion in, in those terms. But Krishnaraja III changes um, the approach to devotion, which we'll discuss below. And whereas his early genealogies, uh, like the Narapati Vijayam, um, and I'll actually pull that up next slide now, uh, were situated uh, within communal struggles for prestige and power in the newly formed colonial con but in the newly formed colonial context the smv that was written at the twilight of krishna raja the third's rule long after um his rule as a hindu king had been reestablished, instead of highlighting religious or communal tensions the smv focuses on dynastic continuity and attempts to reconcile biological succession and divine authority by opening the framework of devotion and kingship. So this section of my talk is divided into two very brief subsections. The first is going to focus on Krishnaraja III's claim to an unbroken line of kingship, despite his indirect biological ancestry. Specifically, it investigates the, the divine line of descent and its supernatural intervention contained in the first and fourth chapters of the SMV that detail the lineage of the lunar, lunar uh, Yadu Vamsha, uh, and the episode of Raja Woodier, one of the uh, sort of legendary uh, former rulers of the Woodier kingdom. In the second subsection, and uh, in the Raja Woodier portion, I'm looking at time, we may have to, to skip over, uh, but uh, I'll hopefully be able to summarize it. Uh, so in the second subsection, I examine the second chapter of the SMV as it provides a story of the establishment of the Woodier kings in Mysore through the authorization of the gods and goddesses. Together, these episodes demonstrate how the SMV reimagines the world of Indian kingship that is unconcerned with mundane administrative and military functions, but is situated in the supernatural. In this realm of supernatural sovereignty, the warrior king and his royal power are directly authorized by divine election and gods and goddesses manifest to select his ancestors and thereby Krishnaraja III himself to govern over the, an incorporeal empire of pilgrimage and devotion.
So let's begin with the introduction uh, to the text. So the introduction to the SND uh, frames the lineage within a Puranic genealogy that begins with the birth of Brahma from the navel of Mahavishnu. In some ways, however, the SMV is even more thorough. Instead of listing the first few generations of cosmic creation, and this is sort of the typical style of a lot of, of um, Shavalis, the SMV lists all generations of the lunar line, starting with Mahavishnu, and it enumerates them. So Mahavishnu is given a one, Brahma two, Atri three, Chandra four, all the way through Vasudeva, bit number 55, and Krishna, uh, number 56. And then it transitions all the way through listing everyone, all the way down to the founders of the Wadir kingdom in Mysore, Yaduraya, number 75, and his brother, Krishnaraya. The lineage, however, is extremely laconic in its elaboration of their births and biological narratives. The mythic ancestry of the Wadir kings follows a precise line, leaving off many subsidiary families, branches, and extraneous details that were commonplace in Puranic renderings of cosmogony or in many other medieval Vamshavalis. Additionally, while the SMB painstakingly narrates every generation of the lineage from Mahavishnu down to the birth of the legendary Yaduraya, there is no discussion of the cosmic intervals of time um, or the cosmic rulers or Manus of those intervals. Without those integral components of the Maha Puranic genre, the emphasis on the grand scope of Indian times absent in the tale. Instead, the SMV reflects European influence in which the genealogy of the Woodier Kings is constructed within linear European time. So here I, I just included a, a sort of map of how the uh, a previous from Shavali from 1800, uh, Boraya Kaveli's Narapati Bajayam, uh, which starts off with Purusha Prakriti, goes through the Tatwas, the Hamkara, through the um, different Gunas, to the birth, through the mentions cyclical time, cyclical time with the, with the Manus. Uh, and so it's sort of a very standard Puranic discussion of time. Uh, but in, once we move to the SMV, and this is actually a, a mural in the Jagan Mohan Palace in Mysore uh, that is a visual representation of uh, the Woodier line, uh, which we'll, we'll get into. It takes this Indic time with the cyclical time and places it into what we could call biblical time, which I'll explain now. Well, the lineage history contained divine actors. This style of genealogy uh, was not unknown to the British. It is quite similar to the genealogy of Jesus given in the Gospels, especially Luke, in which Jesus' lineage is traced to Adam, uh, from which contemporary notions of linear history and time had developed. So the time frame of um, you know, 6,000 years in, in history has developed from this tracing of, of genealogies. And if you look at the timeline in the SMV, uh, it actually maps pretty well onto uh, that same scope of time. So without the framework of cosmic cycles of time, the claims of descent were cast into a historical framework that collapsed divinities, Krishna, for example, Mahavishnu, and mythic time into the realm of human political history. And the woodier genealogy was rendered in a form that was more intelligible to their colonial overlords. And so I think I have a, another illustrative example. So yeah, so here we have uh, Vasudeva, and you can see that he's you know, marked out here is the the 55th uh, and then you have krishna as included in the in the lineage uh, and then krishna raja is the culmination of this family tree so it's it's put placing him in this direct line all the way back to krishna and of course back to mahavishnu eventually so claims to direct descent were a double-edged sword for krishna raja the third in his court since the king himself had no male heirs during the reign of Krishnaraj III, the P British colonial project had been firmly established by the East India Company and cemented during the subsequent annexation of the subcontinent in 1857. One of the most important means through which the in East India Company and the British government in India acquired and subsumed kingdoms was through the doctrine of lapse. Though it had already been enacted in several kingdoms, the doctrine of lapse uh, was first articulated as policy in 1834 by the East India Company chairman, John Forbes. He declared that the EIC operated within India as a sovereign nation with all rights thereof, including the ability to enter into treaties. 
Therefore, the company also had the authority to enforce the treaties through military and political intervention and depose monarchies that had lapsed. The debate over succession and lapse loomed large in Mysore um, during the years in which the SND was composed. Previously, Krishnaraja III had lost direct rule of Mysore kingdom uh, as the result of his minis administrative mismanagement that led to the peasant insurgency of 1830 to 1831. Krishnaraja III fought with the, uh, with the British to have his rule restored, but as the years passed, he turned from such attempts, instead focusing his energies on creating a counter-narrative of Indian kingship through the production of various religious and devotional texts, songs, games, and paintings. However, in 1857, and that's the same year that India officially became a British colony, a Christian Raja III reached his twilight years and still without an heir, resumed his battles with the British administration and petitioned his colonial overlords for permission to adopt a son. And this was promptly denied. For the next eight years, the Maharaja, many of his subjects, and his British friends engaged in a letter-writing campaign intended to impress upon the British administration the loyalty of the king and the unusual circumstances by which he was able, unable to produce an heir. And so this goes to the Roger Woodier section, which unfortunately we don't have time to discuss. Uh, but basically there's a, a curse put on the lineage where every other uh, generation cannot have a, a male heir and they need to adopt. Um, and we could talk about that more in Q&A if, if people would like. It's called the, the curse of Talakad. Um, but the SMB, which uh, the first time it appears in official Umshabli is in the SMB. So the SMB deliberately took into account contemporaneous concerns uh, through its presentation of direct and indirect descent. The text painstakingly sought to recalibrate the what are your divine ancestry with a new frame of linear historiographical consciousness by eliminating references to cyclical mythic time. However, the text did not neglect the divinity of Indian rulers or the role of the supernatural in guiding the events of the lineage past. The SMB constructs a divine foundation that permeates earthly kingship in which the bodies of the kings were not confined to the limits of normative biological processes but function as part of a supernatural world controlled, uh, controlled and regulated by the divine. The relationship between the Woodier Kings and the divine is most apparent in the SMB's expanded version of the Woodier migration to Mysore. This foundational story elaborates upon the regional foundational paradigms replacing the priests, saints, and peers that previously guided soon-to-be kings with the deities themselves who manifest on earth to authorize and guide the woodier progenitors. Thus, the authority to rule is not mediated through a religious professional, but the woodier kings function as king devotees and as religious professionals simultaneously. Though there might be some influence from the largely Protestant British encounter, the direct contact between the divine and the king is far from a Protestant theological shift that is something like priesthood of all believers. Instead, the narrative demonstrates the new role of the king as the devotee par excellence, simultaneously a king and a saint whose election is not proven by birth or in battle, but through his devotion. To demonstrate the devotional constitution of divine authority, the text opens uh, the royal devotional universe to include a variety of deities located in various important regional pilgrimage sites and captures a novel approach to big tent Hindu devotionalism in the Mysore court. The plurality of devotional traditions within the court of Krishna Raja III displays the broad trend in his political approach in which kingship transcended mundane administrative concerns and was authorized by the perennial power of the divine. So at this point, I had planned to read from a translation of the SMV that I had prepared, but instead I'm just going to briefly summarize this again for the sake of time. So as you, we go through this foundational episode, we find that Yadurai and Krishnaraya live in Dwaraka, which of course connects them with uh, the, the Yadavamsha and with Krishna and his kingdom. Uh, but they, they live there as, as princes. Uh, Krishna comes to them in a dream and tells them that they need to go south and find uh, their kingdom. So we have Krishna. Uh, so Vaishnava devotion is, is already there. Uh, 
uh, they, as they're traveling south, they go into um, the Vindyavasni, they're in the Vindya Mountains. And so here we have an image uh, in the PowerPoint of them coming across uh, Vindyavasni, who was also um, recognized as Chamundeshwari, uh, the goddess of Mysore, but they don't make that connection yet. They know her as Vindyavasni. And she says, keep going south, I'll point you to the right place. Then they travel through the old Vijayanagara kingdom, specifically stopping to take Darshana of the important Vaishnava deities there, uh, like uh, Yoga Narasimha, uh, Narayana Swami, Achalava Narayana Swami, uh, of course, Melakote being called Yadu, um, um, Yadu Giri at this point. So it's connecting them also with Vaishnava devotion. Um, and so it's sort of the elements of their uh, family devotional traditions anyway. But once they arrive in Mysore, uh, we also see the incorporation of Shaivism into the um, into the story. Uh, they stop and they're approached by a, um, a Vir Shaiva preceptor, and the text uses the term Vir Shaiva. And I want to be clear about that because of uh, some issues with identity politics. But they call him a Vir Shaiva preceptor, and they form an alliance with this uh, Vir Shaiva uh, Jangama who tells them to take on the identity of a Virashaiva, to wear a linga, to put on orange robes. And if they do this, then they will get the kingdom. The goddess comes again, another uh, Jangama comes, and eventually they're able to win the, the kingdom. And so here we can see if we zoom in a little bit then with the Virashaiva uh, preceptor. So the text, um, let's see, let me skip ahead. So um, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to stop here in order to discuss the opening of the devotional practices narrated in this version of the Woodier foundational narrative and its vision of big tent Hindu devotionalism that united three, the three broad devotional traditions of India within Woodier royal practice. Prior to this time, uh, they had first been sort of identified with the goddess, and then they became very strict Sri Vaishnavas, uh, and uh, specifically Virashivas were said to be um, persecuted in the court under people like Chikadeva, um, Chikadeva Raya Woodier. So by uniting the broad devotional traditions of India, that's Vaishnava, Shaiva, and Shakta, the text was articulating a new vision of Hinduism in which sectarian identity was secondary to religious identity. United under the non-sectarian Hindu tint, Chamandeshwari, Krishna, and Shiva, the three deities of the royal, devo of the royal devotional, work together as separate but equal embodiments of the divine that manifest in order to guide the warriors to their rightful throne. It is significant in this narrative uh, because that it's sandwiched between the genealogical descent of Mahavishnu and the curse of, uh, curse of Talakadu that I alluded to above. As it highlights biological succession, how that's insufficient for dynastic continuity. The divine authority that had been renewed in the process of ongoing biological succession and divine election. In this case, uh, in the case of an interregnum, which was the case of Mysore, the auspices had returned to the deities, uh, who as the head of the Hindu pantheon, heads of the Mysore lineage, had the sole power to authorize the next king. The gods and goddesses manifested to express their election and guide their new ruler to their throne. According to the SMV, the process continued through subsequent generations, and even during the rule of Hyder Ali, when the goddess is said to have guided Chamaraja VIII during his adoption process. Thus, the SMV articulates a complex combination of genealogical descent and divine interaction that perpetuates dynastic continuity even through indirect biological, biological succession, maintaining an unbroken line of kingship even with a broken lineage. And now I'm just gonna skip straight to the conclusion, skip over a little bit. All right, so the genealogies from the court of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III help us to see how the courts of South India developed and expressed sovereignty and dynastic continuity during a period of political change. These texts were sites within which the courts could contest and negotiate different forms of power, political or otherwise. Through the collation of lineage details, the texts construct a political history of the subcontinent, making claims about religious identity, political succession, and the role, divine role of sovereignty. For the genealogist, all of these elements provide an opportunity for the contestation of power that was rooted in the divine election of the ruler and the divine authorization that comes as a result. 
For Tipul Sultan's court, dynastic continuity was centered on his family's history in relation to the important medieval and early modern dynasties and the continuity of able service to proper governance. Biological succession, however, was not sufficient to assume the office. Instead, the rightful king, uh, who he was authorized by, and who he was authorized by, proved his divine election by displaying his God-given royal abilities in court and through devotion to important, both religiously and politically, Sufi peers. Certainly, this shaped Tipu Sultan's relationship with other regional polities as he sought to test their divine injunction through diplomacy and warfare. And I talk more about that in my book, and we can get to the Q and A about it if you want. On the other hand, in the genealogies of Krishna Raja III's court, divine election was a matter of authority of divine ancestry that needed to be re renewed regularly. Their sovereign power, however, was not aimed specifically to rule over the mundane concerns of political administration or to extend their territory through military engagement. The warrior kingdom was a territory of the spiritual world, and they were charged with maintaining the integrity of temples and important pilgrimage centers. The power through which they exercised their divine authority was therefore not mapped onto the worlds of mundane administrative or military power, but was divine and intended uh, to be applied to divine concerns. Theirs was an incorporeal empire of devotion that ran alongside and parallel to the world, the political world. In both cases, the genealogical texts contain narratives that contested power and negotiated political realities. By reframing and redefining authority and power within this period of transition, the genealogical texts of Tipu Sultan and Krishna Raja III reveal unique ways that the courts of both rulers negotiated between their medieval predecessors and the onslaught of colonialism. Thus, the, these tales of lineages and political histories provide interesting insight into the dynamics of the colonial encounter and its effects on the development of sovereignty in colonial South India. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Simons, for that uh, wonderful uh, lecture. I was making notes throughout and uh, one thing that uh, that stuck me and it was in one of your articles earlier was that in in, in pre-modern uh, kingships, pre-modern times, there was this model of uh, hierarchical sovereignty of sorts. There's this overlord, divi divine overlord, who is the king himself in, in some senses. And uh, the earthly overlord is his servant of sorts that he's, you know, he, he was asked by the God to rule. And below that uh, earthly overlord, there are subordinate kings. And this was happening way back in uh, ancient India also, because we have the Puranas, uh, the Dharam Shastras, Devi Mahatma, all that were written. And they were showing these uh, Vanshavalis that you mentioned also in your lecture. Then how did it change? If you can just summarize, how did it change during uh, the the early modern, so difference between pre-modern kingship, hierarchical kingship, and the early modern kingship. Yeah, that's um, that's a, a great question, and um, you know, and that's one I, I get often about the the book itself because the book starts in the colonial period, and it's like, hey, there's continuity and change, uh, but I don't talk much about what came before. And in fact, there is um, it my book when I first submitted, it had an additional chapter at the beginning, which was talking about that a little bit more. And, and now that that article has been po um, published in the journal, Re journal religions uh, as uh, something like the um, devotional foundations of, um, of sovereignty. And what I, what I argue in that article is that if we look at um, pre-modern text uh, and we, we try to think about how sovereignty is, constructed, because this is something that, you know, was myself, whenever I started thinking about kingship, is just, we assume there's rulers, and we assume that um, they there always have been. And that's kind of a weird assumption to think that like, there's a bunch of people and someone has power over all of them, and that this is a natural thing. And so as I as I dove in a little bit more, you know, this, there has to be an argument for this. You can't just do it. Maybe like, if you say you're the strongest, well, there's always going to be someone stronger who can come in. So it's, it's not enough. There has to be um, a broader mechanism to like make this argument for you. And when we look to the Puranas, we see that um, sovereignty is created by the gods. 
Um, and uh, the David Mahatmya is a great example because it actually builds off of um, Manu, uh, laws of Manu, uh, the codes of Manu, however you want to trade the um, uh, Manada Dharma Shastra. So in, in that book, the, um, the kings make, the gods make the original king. Uh, it comes together, and that's in the laws of Manu. Uh, and so we see the flow of, of sovereignty and earthly king. The first Manu is created from their powers. In the Devi Mahatmyam, is where it transferred through the goddess first. And when I read both of these together, what I see is that uh, there is already a hierarchy of gods. There's the king of gods, which, you know, depending on how far back you want to go, you know, Indra, eventually when you get into devotional or, or bhakti Hinduism, it's, you know, whoever is Brahman. Um, and so there's nested hierarchy in the gods. Not all gods are created equal. Uh, and so the assumptions in these texts is that kingship on earth is created to reflect that. Uh, and that there's an earthly kingship, not all kings are created equal, that there is an overlord and there's vassals. Of course, being a historian, it's I see it as, you know, courts of kings writing these texts to sort of make the argument for themselves. I say, hey, we're just doing it like the gods and the gods authorize this. And so through my long reading uh, from all the materials from my dissertation to this book, I really see this as part of the continuity uh, going into the colonial period, because everybody likes to see Tipu Sultan, especially as being radical, like all these changes, all these changes. But in my reading, my dissertation, all I did for the dissertation was I started with the earliest Mysore genealogies found in like um, inscriptions, and then just read through just to see how they changed over time. And when you get to Tipu Sultan, while there's some changes, obviously, because he's Muslim, and actually most of them are very similar. Like he even like commissions new text to be written about the Vijayanagara kings and kind of connects himself to Vijayanagara. So there's continuity there, but the continuity can only go so far because he has to, he's making claims now to a broader audience. Once you have the colonial period, now there's people who don't buy into the Hindu system or the Indian system is, is a better way to think of it. They now have their own ideas of political theology, how succession ought to happen. They were really weird about adoption, which used to be a very regular thing in, um, in Indian king kingdoms and even posthumous adoptions. Like this was never an issue. Uh, but the British thought that this um, was lapse. And so it's taking this sort of devotional continuity form and trying to bring in European notions uh, that wind up making this time such a productive period to think about kingship and sovereignty and how it's constituted and how it's articulated, because they're really having to walk a tightrope between their own uh, vassal states, their own subjects, but also the colonial uh, overlords in the case of Krishna Raja III. And so it's a, it's a productive period to think through about how the concept of sovereignty changes uh, when you have an encounter between two different theological systems. So hopefully that gets to your answers. It was a long-winded roundabout way to get there. <laughs> and that uh, article is, I think, is available for those who want to read it. We can also attach the link in the description later. So you can just click on that link and get to that PDF. And uh, so uh, the, 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 the major point is that the turn to religion was majorly political. It was like saving the Titanic uh, from drowning because they, there was this colonial overtake of overtaking of power so to save their empire to save their political power i think they turned again to uh, religion as their predecessors maybe the ancient predecessors how they did it so they kind of redesigned their own sense of uh, kingship in some senses yeah yeah so i it's, i'm glad you asked uh, that sort of refining question because the one thing that's absent from my description even in this is is warfare warfare is extremely important, right? It's it's not that you just, you know, so anybody can go out and be like, the gods authorized me to be the new king and the yellow kings just can say, oh, okay, you can have it then. Uh, there's also fighting going on and conquest was an important aspect. Uh, and this was always central in the Vamshavalis of, of Mysore. So they had the devotional elements, but then they also included like, we went to this kingdom, we defeated this kingdom, we took over. Even in the story, I, I, when I was summarizing it, I was going quickly. There's also a battle at the end of this. So they get authorized by Shiva, and then they have to go defeat someone in warfare. But what happens with Tipu Sultan in 1792 is he faces 
um, a huge defeat. Uh, he loses battleground. He loses his sons. And at this point, this is where a lot of people say, oh, he became like this zealot. Uh, he uh, started talking about jihad. Uh, all he wanted to do is talk about religion. And that's, of course, one way to read it. It's not the way I read it. I see that this is the opportunity where he says, all right, I can't make my claims based on conquest anymore. I was just defeated. So I, this is not the, the like, it's it's hard at this moment for, for that to be the, the biggest argument because you, no one's going to buy that. So instead, he turns to um, more religious rhetoric. You start seeing him talk about his kingdom as God-given. He starts to talk about other kingdoms at this point as being heretics. And he's not just talking about Christians and Hindus. He's talking about Muslims, too. He points his finger up at Delhi and calls them heretics all the time. So it's not it's not mapped on to like Hindu and Muslim as much as people want it to be. And so I have a chapter about that in my book where it's actually it's much more nuanced, uh, his reading. So anybody who supports him because it's a God-given government is, you know, the faithful, they are correct, they are orthodox. Anyone who doesn't is a heretic. And it's not that he's being just like overly political with this. If he genuinely believes God gave him this um, this kingdom to rule, yes, anyone who tries to stop that rule would then be against God, no matter what religious practice they do. So that was there. But after 1792, so he has to turn to this new form. Same thing with Christian Roger the third. He doesn't even have a military he doesn't have administration administrative powers. So if he was like, this is mine because of conquest and the British would just say, well, we conquered you. It's now ours. Right. So now he has to say, well, how else did I get it? And, you know, my father had been adopted. My son's going to be adopted. So you can't really say I was born into it. Uh, so instead you have to start introducing. And again, I'm not saying these stories weren't always around, but now they're introduced into like the official uh, version of the history where now you have curses that say every other generation and this curse was made to a goddess so it's it's a divine inter intervention not a biological uh, need so it's a new way of framing kind of making arguments to preempt the arguments that the british might have and then do you think this uh, concept of devotional uh, sovereignty also differed from uh, region to region yeah, I mean, that would be a lot for other people to, to, to jump in. I think, you know, I've talked to people up at, who study kingdoms in Rajasthan, and they see a, a very similar movement to devotion in the same period, uh, and some similar things in ge uh, genealogies, but, um, and I, I think it's broader, which is actually why when I submitted the book, it was actually called Kingship and Religion in Colonial Mysore, and the people who were the, the peer reviewers for it, uh, both from very different uh, studies, one who was a, a Mughal religious historian, another was a Rajasthani religious historian, both said this is equally applicable in our cases. So change the subtitle to just kingship and religion in India, because even though you're talking about one case case study, the it's a broader phenomenon that's going on. So actually, that would be a great thing for since this is, you know, inter, um, something with students, like as you're thinking about, you know, your PhD projects or, um, papers for for whatever courses um genealogy is is a right place to go because it's it's very understudied uh, we don't have a lot of work on um early modern and uh, colonial uh, genealogies we we have a lot on some of the older uh genealogies but then there becomes this, this gap in this moment when i think they're actually employed more frequently uh because you have a lot of this indirect rule so just think about vijayanagara successor states as soon as they fall, now like from Shavali genealogy just booms. That's like most of the literature you get at that period is people telling their own stories. Uh, and we were speaking earlier about Manu Deva Deva and, and him taking me around Mysore uh, on the back of his motorbike. And that's what we were doing. We're driving places, uh, buying from Shavali's in, in printed critical editions because there were so many that I had no clue about that I just needed to read from the region. And we're just talking about just the Mysore region uh, that I needed to read at this moment to be able to understand it. So they're everywhere. And uh, last question from my side, because it's already time. And I'll see <laughs> if we have any audience questions for us. Uh, no, I don't see any audience questions. So those who are watching us can send us questions after you go through the book. 
it is available uh, i have seen this book in uh, bookstores in delhi i do not know about other cities so you can always go to online stores uh, be it amazon or any other uh, you have to think about the carbon footprint but uh, <laughs> to get a good book i think you can uh, neglect that <laughs> thing uh, but my final question is because uh, this book talks about a very new aspect of indian history which is using religion and uh, div- divine sovereignty as part of the political process itself how religion played a part in the political development or political history of uh, say colonial india so why do you think religion is an important part to study while studying colonial india or pre colonial india yeah you know i mean we can we can quibble over the the term religion and whether or not it's applicable and i think that's a, a good debate to have because you know prior to colonial interactions or maybe even go up to you know prior to um the solidification of, of muslim power in the north um this this term may not be applicable maybe dharma which isn't easily translated so we could we could talk about that and i think that that's an important thing but the which is why i use divine quite a bit in in my work because i think it in some ways translates a little bit better we talk about devas um with divine we had to cognate there right so we can we can do it a little with a little more comfort uh but when you go like whatever period you're looking at when you look at royal rituals the gods are present um you go to you know, gupta period and and um michael willis's great book about udaigiri um and how the the rituals involved this connection between kings and and the gods there's always been an assumption that there is a connection there and so if you think of ritual worlds of kingship and this is really how kingship is given its power um it's it's so central and so i think that it's a if we if we're thinking about like how did people rule like on the day to day you know probably economic historian military historian like they're going to be the ones that can teach us about daily life uh, but when we start thinking about rhetoric and how these things are theorized um you really have to look toward texts that the british hated uh so like all these puranas this is really where we find out and i think so, more so than the artha shastra more so, so than uh dharma shastra that puranas tell us about theory of kingship because it's not about the day to day it's about how kings and gods interact and how gods have sovereignty how humans have sovereignty and the connection between the two and that's really uh puranic style which we later find in a lot of genealogies opens us up to a world of theory that's been long neglected because a lot of and, and to get to your question about colonialism because when you looked at colonial historians when i go look at the mckinsey collection in uh, the british library um or over in uh chennai uh they heavily redact these vamshavalis uh, and they take out all the references to god because they were just interested in the lineages of the kings and so you wind up missing half of the lineage because half of the lineage is you know people are talking about their connection to to rama to krishna uh, and these things are not meaningless no more meaningless than connections to like jesus or abraham and and other um uh royal context in in different parts of the world so i or you know get to the chinese portion with like you know the uh, sons of heaven so there's this always this like emphasis on power to rule is magical or divine in some way it's not human um and i think this preempts like a lot of people just coming in always being rebellions one after the next because you can make some sort of claim and people they worship the gods you made this connection they can buy it and um it does some work not all the work of course you still got to have a military you still got to be able to like do charity and things like that but it it does part of the work thank you so much dr simons for taking out time to deliver the carvan lecture it was truly uh enriching and i got to lo- learn so much about this and i hope to get the book as soon as possible i'll, I'll write to the right the, the publisher and the bookstore if you can I, i can get the book and we'll also have a separate book discussion very soon that we discussed with uh, the two panelists that we won't disclose now 
but i look forward to hosting you again on car one thank you so much and thank you so much everybody who joined us at uh, 8 pm india time and early morning in america depending on the coast where you are but uh, our next session is scheduled for 15th of june which is a conversation with anchal malhotra on her recent book in the language of remembering which is about generational uh, trauma of partition and how it travels through various generations of not just survivors but also their families do join us for another youtube uh, live on 15 and i i look forward to seeing all of you thank you so much everybody thank you